Thank you, John. Um, so you'll have to forgive me a little bit for this first uh, overly dramatic slide. But uh, when Sally Benson approached me about talking to you today, it was largely because she'd seen some coverage that we got for some work that we'd been, our group had been doing here at Stanford in the press about uh, our work in Nevada um, and Oregon and Idaho, where we had discovered that there were larger concentrations and more places where you could find lithium than people had appreciated before. And uh, through the clever work of the PR people in uh, the School of Earth Sciences, this went to AP and went around. And it was covered widely internationally. And many of the uh, articles like this more or less got the drift, that we were finding places, there were, there were more places than we'd realized uh, to find lithium. Others were sort of cringeworthy, um, like this one, which either attributed us sort of magical powers um, that we were going to pull materials out of supervolcanoes or magical powers to the supervolcanoes themselves. And then the other thing that really bugged me about these is both of these pictures were not pictures of proper supervolcanoes, which just offended my geological sense. <laughs> So this is the more modest uh, title of the paper that we uh, published. And I just want to acknowledge up front that this is uh, Tom Benson. And this work was largely, he was the lead on this. It was a uh, chapter in his thesis. And he's uh, been uh, greatly rewarded for this work. He was hired uh, after he graduated by uh, Lithium America, given a large signing bonus and a huge exploration uh, budget. And he's now traveling the world, going around looking for lithium. And it makes me wish I was 40 years younger, 40 pounds lighter, and uh, two knees better. And I would have loved to have done that myself. Um, this is Jim Rituba, Stanford grad who for the last 40 years has been working on sort of non-traditional mineralization in the U.S. And then here is Matt Koble, who also was a grad student of mine that worked on some of these calderas that I'll be talking about today. And he's now a research scientist in our uh, secondary ion microprobe uh, lab at Stanford. Okay. So uh, despite the sort of crazy coverage that we got, I was very pleased to see that some of the sort of basic science work that we'd been doing in the last uh, decade, working on the, whoops, excuse me. Uh, yeah, there we go. Um, working on the Columbia River basalts uh, and the rhyolitic uh, volcanic eruptions uh, that are associated with the Yellowstone hotspot or hotspot track here that is uh, now centered underneath Yellowstone. Flood basalts are really extraordinarily large eruptions uh, that erupt over a very short period of time, maybe only hundreds of thousands of years, millions of cubic kilometers of basalt. An individual lava flow of some of these larger provinces um, would release as much CO2 as we burn in fossil fuels in a year. And one of the larger one of these here in the Siberian traps is responsible for the largest extinction in Earth history at the end of the Permian about 250 million years ago. And this was caused by the CO2 and sulfur that was emitted by these. And also, as the basalt came through the crust, it uh, deep stabilized carbonate rocks and, and evaporites that contributed more sulfur, burned coal beds. And um, this led to a gigantic extinction. Also, the dinosaurs may have suffered a sort of double whammy that at about the same time a big bolide smacked down on Earth in the Yucatan Peninsula. There were also eruptions uh, in here in India called the Deccan area. And they may have also suffered sort of a, a double blow from this. In contrast, I, I sort of refer to the Columbia River basalts as the friendly basalt. Uh, flood basalts, and that's because they're much smaller in volume, so the amount of CO2 that they emitted just kind of made the middle of the Miocene 16 million years ago kind of balmy. And so it's actually called in the geologic record the middle Miocene climatic optimum. And so our uh, research has largely been focused on the start of that volcanism and the start of the Yellowstone hotspot. And this is a model that sort of explains how this happens that if you um, 
have a plume that comes up and rises through the mantle. As this material rises, it decompresses and starts to melt, and it melts in a huge extent here to produce flood basalts. And then as the tectonic plate passes over the top of it, this sort of tail behind the initial uh, arrival of the head of the plume gives a tail that as the uh, plate goes over, you get a trail of volcanoes. And this is exactly what we see in Hawaii, where the volcanoes get older and older, and the hot spot is actually here, right here, underneath this little Loihi Seamount here. Now that's what happens when you have a hot spot under an ocean, but what I'm interested in is what happens when you have a hot spot under a continent. And in that case, what happens is that the basalt comes in, it intersects uh, continental crust, which melts at a much lower temperature, maybe 700 degrees, and so it melts to form rhyolites. And um, this just is shown here in that this is the track of as North America moved across the uh, tail of that hot spot, you basically kind of, you can think of it like a Bunsen burner, that it burned its way through the crust. Uh, and so we go from 16 to 14 to 12 to 10 million years to now underneath Yellowstone, it's sitting, that is, Yellowstone is sitting right on the Bunsen burner of the hot spot tail right now. Now, when we talk about uh, magmas and erupting, they're physical properties, the shapes of the volcanoes, and the explosivity of the eruptions are mostly a function of viscosity. And rhyolites, because they have a lot of silica in them and they're lower in temperature, are much more viscous than the typical eruptions you've seen of Hawaiian basalts flowing downhill. Many orders of magnitude uh, more viscous. They also contain a lot more water in the magmas with the result that when those magmas rise towards the surface, um, and eventually uh, it reaches the point where it saturates with respect to those volatiles, those volatiles come out of solution, form bubbles, and they begin to expand. But because the magma is so slow to deform in rhyolites, you can get very large pressures. And so sort of uh, similarly to uh, analogous to if we pop the bottle, of champagne where we suddenly allow abruptly CO2 to come out of solution in the champagne. The same thing if you do that to a large volume of rhyolite produces a super eruption. And as volcanologists we can uh, categorize explosive eruptions kind of the same way we do with, with earthquakes on a scale of volcanic explosivity index of 0 to 8. It's a log scale just like earthquakes are. And the kinds of calderas that are centers I'm going to talk about today rank six through eight on these kinds of scale. And just for comparison, the Mount St. Helens 1980 eruption was a magnitude five. Um, the Eiffel eruption that, uh, in Iceland that shut down all the airports in Europe for a while was a magnitude, uh, this one was a magnitude four. So supervolcanoes technically are those where you have an eruption of 1,000 cubic kilometers of magma over a period of, of hours to at most days. Now, these huge volumes of magma result in high convective columns that can reach uh, 10, 20, 30, 40 kilometers into uh, above the uh, vent. And this means that you get into the stratosphere, and that means that the ash that gets up there and the gases that it takes up are capable of being transported by high elevation winds, and you can actually have effects on climate. Sometimes those eruption columns collapse and flow away under the force of gravity, and then you have essentially an avalanche of hot pumice and ash, maybe 600 degrees C, that moves at hundreds of kilometers an hour uh, and destroys everything in its path. And here's uh, the stratospheric winds can move this material. So this is an example of the latest two big eruptions in North America. One from Yellowstone, um, spread ash here, and another one in Eastern California um, that spread um, ash here. And just for comparison, here's the little pipsqueak of Mount St. Helens in 1980. Now, if you take hundreds to thousands of cubic kilometers of magma out from underneath uh, the uh, 
out of a magma chamber, um, basically what you do is you remove uh, support for the roof of the magma chamber. And so what happens is the roof falls in. So in contrast to other kinds of volcanoes, these super eruption volcanoes are not, whoops, are not like pointy things like this is my own, which is actually erupting these days. Instead, they're actually kind of, they're not kind of, they are big holes in the ground, big circular holes in the ground. And this is a 20 to 30 kilometer uh, hole in the ground that formed um, 767,000 years ago. Have any of you ever skied on Mammoth Mountain? If you've ever skied, that's it. And you're looking across the caldera from that eruption. That caldera can then fill with water, forming a caldera lake, like this one at Crater Lake in Oregon. And eventually, that lake can partially fill with sediments and with lavas. Now, calderas um, formed by these super eruptions have features that make them really good hosts for ore formation. One is that the caldera lakes accumulate volcanic ash and uh, ashy sediments, materials that, by virtue of being glassy, are not stable in the weathering environment, and by virtue of their fine grain size, are easily leached and altered. Um, also, they have a lot of structures in them that are due to the initial inflation of the magma chamber that uh, breaks the rocks and faults like that. And then when you uh, allow the magma chamber to collapse after the big eruption, you get another set of faults. And if you reinflate it uh, with post caldera eruptions, you get more faults. So this is an example of a sandbox model, model of uh, put, putting a balloon under this and sort of showing the kinds of fractures that form. The point is, is you have lots of fractures, and so there's um, a wonderful opportunity for fluids to flow around in the crust. And that's usually uh, ca required before you get ore deposits. And finally, you have abundant heat. You have heat from the magma chamber that's left behind. Uh, you have heat that might be added to that magma chamber afterwards. You have heat from lavas uh, that erupt along dikes and uh, here. And it's these, this heat of the magma chamber and things coming up along the fractures that bound the caldera that drive hydrothermal circulation and promote alteration of the ash deposits in the lake sediments. And so it's long been known that, um, as shown by this old model from uh, Silito and Bonham in 1984, that these are uh, good places to find ore deposits of gold and silver and base metal mineralization. But they're also, we think, good places to look for energy critical elements. And by that, I mean elements that are critical to one or more of uh, energy-related technologies such as solar panels or wind turbines or electrical vehicles. And we can express this um, in what's called a criticality matrix. And this is from a DOE study in 2011, where basically you plot the importance of any particular element for all of these fancy new technologies versus the supply risk. And the supply risk is really how diverse the sources of the raw material are. So if we don't have any US sources for it. It obviously has a very high supply risk. Or if the sources in foreign countries are unfriendly or politically unstable, or if they're just in one country. And for example, the one we mostly have problems with nowadays is many of our sources of things are in China. Um, and so that creates a problem. So this was in 2011, and it shows um, lithium here as being in what it calls near critical, whereas rare earth elements, um, which China has the market cornered on, essentially, are uh, considered critical. Now, since 2011, the, the world has actually changed a little bit um, with the fact that we have greater use of lithium batteries to power all of our uh, digital devices. Um, we have it now for storage batteries. We also use it to run tools. And of course, the big thing is the development of electrical hybrids and fully electrical vehicles. So you can see that this is a plot of the price per ton for lithium that took a jump at the time we brought in cell phones. And then there's another one that came in when we started seeing more and more electric vehicles. And of course, this has accelerated in the last few years with many um, automotive companies saying they're going to shift towards um, electrical vehicles. And this is just showing what the anticipated um, number of electrical vehicles are in the US, China, 
Japan and Europe uh, from about 1 million now to uh, in 2030 to something like 25 million. So if we look at what a Tesla has in it, um, there's this huge battery pack of which uh, actually only 15 pounds of it is lithium right here. That's about the weight of a bowling ball, but you're going to need 25 million bowling balls just to make the cars that we're going to want, we anticipate having. And that doesn't count all the other things like big storage batteries uh, and other things. So this probably means that um, lithium is increasingly moving towards um, the criticality corner because it's becoming more and more important. So let's look at global lithium resources and reserves. So what we see here, resources are just kind of very dreamy estimates of how much we think is out there. It's not the same thing as proved reserves. It's resources are kind of what we guesstimate from the geology. And what you can see right away is that the big ones here, this is a log scale, are in Chile, Argentina, and Bolivia, or what's sometimes called the lithium triangle, where these are uh, in salars, are brine deposits. And you can see that all these others uh, are smaller resources. Um, and, but more critical in this is this is the 2015 lithium production in kilotons. And what you can see is the United States is just barely off of the zero line. Most countries are still on the zero line. So the biggest producers are Argentina, Chile, and Australia. And if we compare that to the amount of uh, the resources um, of the various types of clay, pegmatite, and brines. These are the, what we think are for sure the reserves, which are a lot less than what the sort of airy-fairy resources are. And this is our range of estimates for total global lithium consumption. It's a wide range. If it's down here, we're good. If it's up here, we're not so good. So let's look at the three types of lithium deposits. There's pegmatites, which are coarse-grained granitic rocks and exposures of deep levels of the continental crust. Um, and then there are brines that are saline groundwater in closed basins that are surrounded by lithium-rich volcanic rocks in arid climates where you can promote evaporation. And then finally, clays, which are the ones we've been working on in sedimentary rocks and closed basins that are also surrounded by lithium-rich volcanic rocks. So pegmatites are small but mighty. Um, they're small deposits, but they're high grade, typically things like 1% weight percent, because they have minerals like spodumene and lipidolite micas. And here's a little Home Depot bucket. You can see these individual crystals of spodumene. They're really gigantic, and these pegmatites are easy to get out. They're relatively benign environmentally, but not hard to mine. The metallurgy is easy. And it was pegmatites that were, which were the main source uh, in, through the 20th century for lithium when it was mostly used for ceramics and glass, lubricating greases, and a variety of manufacturing uh, things. So this is the most productive peg, uh, pe lithium mine in the world. It's an uh, open pit mine and a pegmatite in Australia. Um, and these are the, the big spodumene crystals that are found in that. Second, we have brines. And these, as I said, are these saline groundwaters. This is the Salar de Atacama in Chile. And there are a bunch of these salars, or playas full of water, um, that are in this area of overlap between Chile, Bolivia, and Argentina, or the so-called lithium triangle. So just some pictures of so the Salar de Atacama, the huge uh, brine evaporation ponds. They, you drill down, extract brines from shallow groundwater, and uh, then put it in uh, these uh, basically man-made playas to allow the sun to evaporate uh, it until you precipitate lithium carbonate. In the U.S., the lithium brine resources are in a little bit different setting in that they're basically whoops, in um, basins that are formed um, here in the Basin and Range province of the United States where the continental crust is being extended. And what this does is create um, basins and ranges, basins and ranges, hence the name of the area. And as those uh, fill up, sediments accumulate there, 
Um, and so, for example, this is the Black Rock Playa uh, is an example of these in there. Now, when you're talking about basin and range, um, that means that Nevada is one of is basically all in the basin and range, and so Nevada is really the home of lithium in North America, and. It is, this is the brine evaporation ponds at the Silver Peak Mine in Clayton Valley, which is located here. And this Silver Peak Mine is the only lithium mine that's currently operational in the United States. And it produces 4% of the annual production of uh, lithium carbonate. And in this geologic cross section, you can see the ore grades or the, the brines that are found in altered volcanic rocks, which are on the order of 40 to 320 ppm lithium. And this is compared to the brines that are taken out of the Salada de Atacama, which are much, much richer in lithium, presumably because the evaporation is much greater in that very dry area. Then finally are the clays, and the clays are kind of analogous in the sense that they're, they're, they're sort of paired with the uh, brine deposits in the sense that um, what happens is that in some places near faults where hot fluids come up, um, lithium instead of going down and in the sump of the playa in the lowest part of the basin will be sequestered in clays um, near springs or in zones of upwelling. And the clay that's generally found is called hectorite. And this is a lithium-bearing clay. Um, and the uh, place that that's found in the, United, in the United States, again here, is in Nevada. And this is the King Valley deposit at the McDermott Caldera um, in northern Nevada. And here you can see where they're scratching around on the ground to figure out where they're going to get these clays out of the sediments there. Now, McDermott is the largest known lithium deposit in the United States, and it's of this clay type, which is shown in green. So here are the Salaris of uh, the uh, lithium triangle in South America. Um, here's the Clayton Valley deposit of the brine um, in the United States. But McDermott is by far the biggest known resource in the US. And it's kind of a subset of these clay type lithium resources because instead of being in a basin, the ore shown in red here actually occurs in a caldera in the caldera lake sediments that accumulated in that caldera that formed about 16 million years ago. And the clays in those caldera lake sediments contain up to 9,000 ppm lithium, although typical grades are about a third of that. Here's a picture of the King Valley hectorite bearing caldera lake sediments. And this is the hectatone, trademark, plant in Fernley, Nevada. I was sort of embarrassed to discover, I was telling people, oh, I'm working on this really green thing. We're working at McDermott, and they're going to get lithium out of it, blah, blah, blah. And then I discovered that the main thing that they used hectorite now is for uh, developing drilling muds. Um, that are used in fracking and other places because hectorite has thixotropic properties and it's thermally stable up to about 300 degrees C. So that's the main use that it's being used for now. They're still working on the uh, sort of metallurgy to figure out how to get the lithium out. Okay, so when Tesla announced in 2014 that they were going to build a gigafactory for lithium batteries here just outside of Reno, this essentially set off a lithium rush in most of the basin and range uh, province. And moreover, they said they'd attempt to source uh, all of the lithium in North America. Now remember, the only deposit in the US that's operating right now is at Clayton Valley, and it only produces 4% of the world's uh, current production. Once Tesla ramps up, they could use the whole world's production right now just to, for their vehicles. Okay, So this is, uh, and this lithium rush has also been promoted by the continued uh, increases in prices of lithium as things have not come online, this 2015 up to today, as fast uh, as people had hoped in terms of supply. So it's lagging uh, behind demand. This lithium rush actually 
resulted in people zooming all around here, laying, staking claims in every playa out throughout Nevada, and lots of promotion of properties. For example, this by Faraday Future is showing exactly how far away they are from the existing mine and how far away they're going to be from the Tesla Gigafactory. Here's another one of these kinds of advertisements uh, promoting that here's the Gigafactory and here's where our claims are, so you should invest in us. And of course, there's a lot of geologists running around with their hammers hitting on clay-rich sediments in the same basins, um, trying to find more of these clay-type deposits. Another thing that has augmented this, and it's most recently, is that in December 20th, President Trump signed an executive order um, that is a federal strategy to ensure secure and reliable supplies of critical minerals. This actually goes beyond the energy critical ones to things that are important in defense and other things. And it directs the Department of the Interior to develop a strategy to reduce reliance on foreign sources for critical minerals, um, tells the USGS to go find more of these. And although they don't say it, it's sort of implicit that maybe we should be sort of relaxing some of the mining, the, the rules, the environmental rules to make it easier for people to produce these things uh, in, in the US. So here's uh, my, my little plug um, showing our research area with respect to the Tesla Gigafactory. But um, I just want to say, and this is Tom Benson looking out and again on these clay rich rocks. And, but I do want to say that this actually comes out of over a decade's worth of work, a sort of basic science study of trying to understand what happens at the initial point of impingement of a um, plume uh, that produced the Columbia River basalts and a bunch of rhyolites in the beginning of the Yellowstone hotspot. Our detailed mapping and 4049 data showed uh, that we actually could track the progression of calderas moving away from the impingement point and that these represent, we think, where this plume had impinged and then sent gigantic dikes um, across the landscape uh, that caused melting in the crust to give us the rhyolite supervolcanoes. Now, when we worked out there, one of the things we noticed was that McDermott caldera is unusual in that it has the degree of mineralization um, compared to, say, all these other little circles or other calderas, um, compared to them. Historically, there had been mercury and uranium mines. Uh, and uh, we've already said that it's the largest lithium resource in the U.S. with two megatons of lithium deposits within these caldera lake sediments in red here, uh, the deposits in the yellow sediments. Also, there's other energy critical elements, ur uranium, gallium, the rare earth elements, and yttrium that also occur here um, along the ring fractures that, fractures that bound the caldera collapse. So our question was, what makes McDermott caldera special? Was it something about the magma composition? Is it something about the nature of the underlying crust? And what are the controls on the abundance of the energy critical elements in rhyolite magmas? And this has implications for mineral exploration, because are there, for example, undiscovered deposits um, in some newly discovered calderas that Tom had mapped here north of McDermott, that all that yellow is also caldera lake sediments, uh, might they be there? Might they be in other 16 million year calderas in Nevada and Oregon, or, uh, or what about worldwide? And the reason this is important is that large rhyolitic calderas are widespread in the western US. These are ones that are 16 million years here on the triple junction between Oregon, Idaho, and Nevada. And these are ones that are a little bit older that spread all the way across Nevada uh, and into Utah. So how do we go about determining magmatic concentrations? You can't trust the rocks. Um, you can't just go out and grab a rock and analyze it. And the reason is, is that lithium is uh, very, uh, it loves to jump into the vapor phase. So on eruption, it jumps into the vapor. And so the magma loses a lot of the lithium in it. So the deposits don't have as much as the magma had to begin with. Also, because it's a little ion plus one, it's easily leached on weathering, and it's also easily mobilized when rocks get altered uh, in the weathering environment or at a little bit higher temperatures. So what's better? 
Um, these are, we can use melt inclusions. And this idea is that it, this is a crystal that's growing in a magma. So this is a crystal that's a few millimeters long. And these in crystals, as they grow, they grow around little blebs of the magma. And so they trap little bits of the magma so that we can actually analyze those little bits to get at what the original concentration was. And if you use a mineral that doesn't break apart as it undergoes depressurization, um, they act as little pressure vessels, essentially preserving the pre-eruptive concentrations that, uh, of these. And then, of course, once the rocks are on the surface, those crystals also protect those little things from being uh, weathered or altered. And so we collected, uh, we studied melt inclusions from a variety of geologic settings of places with different types of continental crust here at McDermott, nearby High Rock at Yellowstone, where the hotspot plume is right now, an area of thicker crust here, thin crust in Mexico, and one here where it's very thin crust between Sicily and Tunisia. And we analyzed melt inclusions in crystals of quartz, SiO2, growing in these. And this is a plain light view. And you can see this is one of these little melt inclusions. And this is a picture uh, in cathodoluminescence where you can see these melt inclusions. And these are the little spot sizes. So the melt inclusions are about 100 millimeters, 100 microns, and the spot sizes are only a few tens of microns. So what we do is we take those crystals, we mount them in epoxy, and then we polish them down, exposing the melt inclusions, and then we analyze them for 42 elements uh, using the uh, shrimp RG at Stanford, calibrating um, against natural glasses. Now, the shrimp RG is a, a, sec a ion probe that is a gigantic thing. And so because it's so big, it's uh, highly sensitive and has great resolution. And so you can analyze uh, spots like this that are only tens of microns in diameter that only go down a short distance in this at the PPM level for a wide range of elements. So what are the results of what when we did that? So this is a plot of lithium, and notice it's a log scale, versus rubidium. And re we just choose rubidium because rubidium is an element that as things crystallize and evolve, it tends to increase. So again, here are the spots that we analyzed on these melt inclusions using the ion probe. And these are the abundances of all the different tufts that are from McDermott, or the volcanic rocks that are from McDermott. And what we found is they all have similar lithium concentrations prior to eruption, about 1,400 ppm. This is much higher than the average rhyolite glass globally. So then we um, analyzed other things. So here's one from Hideaway Park. And you can see this is actually quite a bit higher than uh, McDermott, up at you know, 7, 8, 9,000 uh, ppm. Oops. And Yellowstone. Um, has values that are rather similar, in yellow here, rather similar to the McDermott Tufts. But those that were um, from High Rock and Primavera are lower, um, we think, because they're on thinner, more mafic continental crust. And the very lowest values are here from Pantelleria, down here at only about 100 ppm. And so this was a very surprising result to us, that there was an over two orders of magnitude difference in the magmatic concentrations of lithium. So what this says is that if you're going to go exploring for lithium, there's certain kinds of volcanoes in certain settings that you should be targeting first, um, because those are the ones that kind of start out with the most lithium to begin with. And when you plot all the data together, again, with the lithium here on a log scale against zirconium, and where basically zirconium we can use as a proxy for how thick and ancient um, and uh, evolved the continental crust is, with it getting more evolved with the lower, whoop, whoop, whoop. Uh, yeah, sorry. My apologies. Um, lower zirconium. What we found is that there was a correlation that those things that have the highest concentrations are in thick continental crust. McDermott, which goes through transitional continental crust, is here. 
where it's more mafic accreted island arc terrains, the values are lower, and the lowest values of all were in thin continental crust. So what this tells us is if we're going to look for rhyolite calderas that have the biggest endowment of lithium, we should be looking for those that are on thick, felsic, old continental crust. The other interesting thing was that McDermott, which we know has huge resources, has concentrations that are very similar to the values at Yellowstone. So this suggests that other hotspot calderas in the western US might be able to host similar lithium concentrations. Let's skip this one. So what about other energy critical elements? Um, we analyzed a number of them, and I'm just going to go through a couple. But this is for gallium, and then the rare earth elements were lanthanum stands for the light rare earths, dysprosium for the middle, and ytterbium for the heavies. And the interesting thing is the McDermott tuff, where we know we have minor uh, mineralization, is among the highest. It's the purple, but it's not like way out of the range of the rest of them. And so. And all of these localities in Nevada and Oregon have values that are a lot higher than average continental crust here uh, in gray. So what this tells us is that uh, McDermott is special, but not too special. And so that means we should be looking for other things. And this is um, some work that's ongoing by Jackson Borkart, a uh, master's student, where he's ha found hints of anomalies at a newly discovered caldera here at Hawks Valley Lone Mountain, um, where he's, here he is looking over one of these calderas. And uh, he's found that uh, there are uh, anomalous units of, with much higher two to 10 times the values of yttrium, which is kind of a proxy for heavy rare earths, and the light rare earth lanthanum much higher than average continental crust. And like McDermott, there, those samples are found right around the fractures that bounded the calderas. We also note that in the calderas that uh, Tom Benson discovered and mapped up here is that there's a huge volume of caldera lake sediments. This is a cross section. Um, that's constructed across here. There's also some drill core data. And there's something like on the order of a couple of hundred meters by about 20 kilometers uh, worth of lake sediments, all of which could potentially be um, a source for those. So this is an important result because it means that there's the potential for more lithium than we might have anticipated. And it's here, right here, in the Western uh, US. So I'm just going to finish by sort of making the case that calderas have all the necessary ingredients for a world-class lithium deposit, and maybe for some other things, like gallium and rare earths. They have continental crust that can produce um, lithium-rich magmas when it's melted. They on collapse of the caldera on a voluminous eruption, you create a closed basin. That closed basin kind of is like a solar in uh, Chile, but it's even more closed. And in that basin, um, caldera lakes, sediments, which will from, be from erosion of all this ashy debris and more explosions might put more ash in there. And uh, Post-caldera eruptions along the fractures that bound the calderas create more glassy material that can be leached. We have hydrothermal alteration due to magmas that are intruding underneath here, the remnants of the magma chamber, and lots of faults and fractures along which fluids can flow. Um, and this allows for leaching of lithium out of things at the surface and perhaps even having lithium added by continual degassing of magma that's sitting down here at depth. And then finally, we have a position in the caldera lakes where we can form illite clays uh, deep in the caldera lake sequence in which lithium can be sequestered um, at concentrations of several thousand uh, ppm lithium. So what are the takeaway messages on this? One is that lithium is most enriched in those rhyolites that are formed by melting of thick ancient continental crust. The other thing is, is that when you do the calculation, it turns out that the magmas don't have to be enormously enriched 
in lithium as long as the system is big enough. So in other words, if you have moderate enrichments but a big caldera with lots of material to scavenge the lithium out of, you can make a deposit. So what this does is it expands the potential places that you can look. Um, these rhyolitic calderas with caldera lake sediments, as I've noted before, are widely disseminated in the western US. And so it suggests that there's very likely to be other deposits like McDermott um, King Valley could be found. And finally, uh, young intracontinental caldera, intra calderas worldwide, if we went and looked around, um, may contain significant clay resources. And if I were going to, somebody gave me a big uh, exploration budget, what I would do is I'd target first those areas that are upstream of some of these uh, salar deposits. For example, go up into the Andes in uh, Peru and in Bolivia and look for the calderas that produce the volcanic rocks that shed their lithium down into the salars. And with that, I'll take any questions. So you can't, you basically have a window in which the calderas can't be too old. Because if they get too old, then you would erode them. And all of these caldera lake sediments would be gone. And so some of the ones that we've talked about in my volcanology class where we're in the San Juan Mountains and you know there's 14,000 foot peaks and a huge amount of vertical relief. In a lot of those, some, many of them, the caldera lake sediments have been stripped away by erosion, but not in all of them. So for example, Creed Caldera is 35 million years old and it has beautiful caldera lake sediments still preserved. So the trick is, is finding places where those caldera, you've got the right erosion level So uh, I am somewhat interested. So I'm thinking about like if you would actually go out to like look for the lithium, then you um, you said there was something to do with like hydrothermal alteration, moving things. How localized is the resource? Let's say you go and you find the caldera, but it's huge, or I don't know how big these things are. And you want to you know make only a fairly small uh, mine. How would you how would you use volcanology to determine? where, like, how widespread would the lithium be? Well, the ones, for example, in McDermott are, um, go on for literally kilometers. And they tend to be um, strata bound. That is that there are certain layers within the caldera lake sequence that have just the right permeability, and presumably they're at just the right temperature um, from being buried that, that these clays form. And so they are, in the case of uh, McDermott, I don't know if I can. I don't want to make you all dizzy by going back. I hate that when people do that. Uh, <laughs> um, they, they go for on the order of, of uh, the individual deposits might be two kilometers by five kilometers. And there's several of them in the caldera. So they're large. Um, so the, the trick is also, of course, is that they're, they're laterally extensive. But they may not be vertically extensive. And if they're too deep, then you, you know, if you have to strip off a lot of overburden, then they wouldn't be economic. So there's aspects of, of the, the mining of them, because pretty much you'd have to do it by open pit, just the nature of the, the material, um, because it's a soft rock. You can't drill down into it and make tunnels. Um, so you've got to have it near enough to the surface that it doesn't, you don't have a lot of costs from overburden. And so for example, the, the King Mountain, uh, ones at McDermott are right, right on the surface in many places. And then locally, they kind of follow a, a certain stratum in the Caldera Lake sediments, and then they get down to maybe a few hundred feet. But that's, that's OK you know, in terms of mining economics. Other questions? Presumably, the source of all of these uh, resources. How, how, how big is that resource? I, I think um, 
that people are just starting to talk about that. And of course it would be like brilliant, right? If you could both use the, you know, the enthalpy of them and then get the lithium out of them too. Most of them don't have really high concentrations of lithium. But the Clayton Valley deposits only have, you know, 100 ppm, 200, 300. Um, so I, I, think, I think that's a, a big thing to do in the basin and range, personally. I, I think that trying to find places where we've got sort of low temperature geothermal resources um, that are widespread in Nevada and get lithium out of them would be really great um, and would be better than going around, frankly, and digging up playas, you know, if you could. For agriculture or other uses and vulnerable to erosion, does that fade the way your McDermott caldera? No, I, I, I don't think so. Uh, let me just, I, I think that, well, having worked in Nevada and been in places where they had active gold mines, as long as the BLM keeps people's feet to the fire and said, you have to reclaim that, um, often it's, it doesn't look too bad. I mean, if you didn't know the landscape, you might go in and think it's okay. In the case of China, for rare earths, um, the reason it's barren is not simply because they're making a big mess. The reason is, is for example, there used to be a, a major mine in California called Mountain Pass. And it got shut down because rare earth elements, when they occur in minerals, almost always occur with uranium and thorium. And so as soon as you mine that stuff, you create this waste that's highly radioactive. Okay, and that essentially did in Molly Corp's attempts at Mountain Pass. They just couldn't make a go of it financially because of our environmental rules, right? Which is a good thing. We don't want radioactive stuff going into the groundwater or being spread around. But that's what they're talking about in China, where if you have places where they don't quite or haven't, at least in the past, haven't been so cognizant or concerned about that, um, then. Uh, they can do things at lower cost or, or just do things that we just simply can't do at all. There's interest in extracting ores from underwater volcanoes. Is there any potential for lithium from those? The underwater volcanoes are in the oceans, and um, those are good for things like manganese and uh, a bunch of metals, titanium, other things. Um, but lithium, we found, is only concentrated in those places where there's continental crust. And it's because it's been sort of processed through Earth history over time. So the oceans, no, not a good place to. Now, seawater, maybe. Right, because when we erode the continental crust, some of that lithium goes into solution in seawater, but the concentrations are really low. Understanding of the process, it seems like it was very challenging to actually work at identifying the concentration of lithium in these various deposits. I guess how mature would the process, if you have identified these locations where there's a reasonably good chance of a you know, economically viable concentration of lithium. How mature is the process for actually extracting the lithium metal? Right, so that was what I, I was saying is the problem with the clay deposits right now, is they're working on it. But they've been working on it for about five or six years. But, but according to Lithium America, they're almost there um, to figure out how to turn um, hectorite either into lithium carbonate or lithium hydroxide. And they've been working with uh, some German metallurgy companies to figure out how, how to do it. Pegmatites, simple. Uh, the, those minerals are easy to break down. You get the lithium out of it. It's, but the clays, we haven't, we're, not, we're not there yet. But I, I, don't, it's not, I don't think that that's a, a huge problem. Actually, market tests. So you talked about um, test locations. Have they done any contracts yet, or if not, when do you think they will start doing so? Um, 
after this paper came out, we got a we got a phone call from a vice president at oh, Tesla. Did. Oh, did. <laughs> Elon Musk like said, "You better find out what they're what they're talking about." Um, as far as I know, they are not in any uh, special ar arrangements. That but I don't know the the details of that. the The real problem that I see is that, um, for example, Lithium Americas, which owns uh, King Mountain, the one deposit that's a clay deposit, recently got a huge infusion of capital from a Chinese company. Now, this is what what is, we do in this country. We let anybody is this, invest, is right? This in the current administration? And, well, no, it was even before the current administration. And so the problem is, is that, you know, now it's almost half owned by a group that, you know, may or may not be motivated to develop that because maybe they want their lithium brines or whatever in China to be. So uh, I think there's, um, I mean, my, my theory is that Elon Musk and all the people that want to make electric vehicles should, they should all get together, they should form a consortium, and they're going to say, we are going to find this stuff, we're going to find it, we're going to develop the metallurgy, and we're just going to, like, just do it. The whole, you know, the whole from supply to using it to recycling it. We're, of course, now going to send them this video to you. <laughs> Great. One last question. I was wondering, uh, are there any bad things that are in there with the uh, lithium deposits that, that they're going to have to deal with as they extract it? No. Not that I, well, not that I know of. I haven't, I haven't heard of anything. Um, no, they're just, you know, their clays are pretty benign. And the, the biggest issue would just be making a mess if you're going out and, and doing open pit mines. Well, uh, time is just about up, so um, <laughs> <laughs> most of us don't know vul volcanology. Thanks for a fascinating introduction and for making it so pra pragmatic on the energy materials side. Thank you once again.